another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we have our first returning guest, Larkin Seipel, DP of the Netflix show Beef. It's a great one, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. A lot, a lot of changes from since the last time I spoke to you with uh, Everything Everywhere, because I remember every conversation I had after you, they were like, I just saw this movie. It was fucking cool. I can't wait for other people to see it. And I was like, that's fascinating. I also saw it. <laughs> That uh, I don't really yeah. want to. I don't. I don't want to hit you with the, like how like how's life been since then? No. But I, do, I am no, interested. That's a good question. Um, it's I don't. It's I don't. Award, awards are weird, and um, you know, like my favorite movie of the year was After Sun. Um, sure. And you know, I don't know how much they truly change things because for me, like I'm I'm looking for really you know interesting and unique directors and i feel like you know they they'll be attracted to your work whether you win an award or not like i feel like the for me like in terms of like collaborators reaching out and or new projects i feel like people will go to you based on your body of work outside of any awards i'm not sure how much awards actually affect like technicians to be honest um right nice for like maybe commercials things like that where like people hiring you don't understand why they're hiring you necessarily Right, but they can find that thing, you know. And go look at that. But yeah, but in terms of like movies and things like that, I think you know I would have been reached out regardless, um, right. if I or not. But yeah, no, it's great. It's the highest honor you can get. I never thought it was going to happen. We we were all pretty shocked about it. So it does feel. I mean, just from my perspective, interviewing other DPs, there there was a lot of talk about how, oh, maybe Hollywood will take this hint that like doing unique personal stories is better than stories that attempt to appease every demographic that you can possibly come up with. Um, even though I, I do feel that film was a pretty universal story, but it was very specific, you know? Um, yeah. but all, yeah, all the DPs, I would not probably go back and listen to a whole ton of them because there's maybe just a uh, dive embarrassment. Cause I think it's maybe a little too much, uh, congratulating, but, um, yeah, really, really well done on that, man. I'm, pr I'm proud of you. Thanks. <laughs> um, and then you went off and did Gaslit, which was fucking rad too. Yeah, that was uh, my first real TV show. That was a, a hoot. I wasn't. That was like a much bigger show than I had done doing eight hours of TV. Um, but it was you know I had a great connection with the director Matt Ross, and we just we had a great time making it. Which is you know some some shows you're, are painful to make, and some are pleasant. And that one was. Just kind of, you know, it's in the seventies. It's kind of silly and dark. We just kind of had a great time, and the actors were wonderful. So it was a great experience, kind of dipping my toes in the TV and actually like doing it and having sets and a back lot and the whole, the whole shebang. Yeah. Were there any kind of um, surprises or lessons that you learned, kind of switching from television and commercials and music videos, or sorry, movies and commercials and music videos into television? Well, I mean, with films you you know films are sacred and every scene is wildly important and or else it shouldn't be in the movie you don't want to waste people's time um so you you're really thoughtful about the shot structure and, and with tv that is present but you're also making a ton of images and creating a ton of scenes and so what i feel like what happens is you start to realize that um the filmmaking is important but the performance is almost more important in television in a way i know it sounds silly no, a, a, a few DPs have said that, that like television is all performance and then movies is like all silent. In, like you could do a whole movie well, in well, silence. Well, you get to be a filmmaker. You get to make bold choices. The audience is using it as like, a you know, it's a much, it's a much shorter read in a way. You know, I almost I would think of it like a short story is to me a feature where it's like this bold choice of these big things. And a TV show can be closer to a novel where you start to infer things and you just, you know, the plot becomes a much bigger part of it. Um so with Gaslight, we ended up really enjoying the performances and we we changed and we went from like one camera to two and then the three and then we started letting the actors improvise. And so that changed how we shot it. You know, we would make bold swings for certain scenes, but a lot of times we just kind of let the actors do their thing. It wasn't like we were just handheld and grabbing it, but we tried to find a way to let them do it because they were all kind of firing on all cylinders. They were 
they were great and they would change it up and they would play with each other. And that was really exciting to kind of focus on just like capturing performance and less about like dramatic camera moves. And what does the, you know, what does the headroom say about the actor in the scene? Things like that. We kind of got to let go. Yeah. Do, do you find that to be, um, this is a stupid question, but more relaxing in a, in some way, or is it the same amount of stress? I mean, it's, it's, you know, well, on that type of pace, if you're shooting for a hundred days and eight hours of stuff, you, um, you, you want to find a way to enjoy your, your work and not be stressed. And also Gaslit's like a, you know, it's a black comedy, so it's, right. it's dark and funny. And so it's, it's, it's different It's things are less sacred or precious. And so you kind of let go to a degree. Um, we also had like really beautiful sets. I feel like anywhere, anytime you're shooting and you have great locations your job is so much easier because you can you don't mind pointing the camera around or like you can find frames anywhere um and the lighting can be you know incorporated into it um that's what really gives you the freedom is a great set yeah um, but, you know, i think it was, it was fun yeah we we've every other episode of this podcast with someone that brings up how important the production designer is and how they're the dp's best friend because locations and sets uh yeah or at least what your filming needs to be good <laughs> and that is the definition of you know to me cinematography of half the time is a great location and you should kill yourself on location scouts because if you get a bad location then you're, you're just, you know you're already losing you know it's an uphill battle at that point i feel like you need to get invested early yeah. you know also i mean the movies that win best cinematography are all these amazing locations you know like epic war battles in crazy places or like you know sunsets in new zealand things like that like it's like that's what people think of um and those are the things you have to find they don't think of you know the close-ups you lit in like the the small bare room yeah 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 the uh are you are you watching anything you like right now um <laughs> i mean i kind of like go in a polar opposite direction and in terms of i find shows that are like I forget we're watching party down <laughs> oh, sure. the remake the reboot or not the reboot the new season because I find it's just a fun release and it's also so LA it's just kind of funny to like see a modern take on LA politics in the film industry yeah that's a good one M mild cinematography in there <laughs> yeah I mean it's fine it works it's fun you know yeah. I don't I, it's a, think about how they execute it because you're just again following these these you know comedians doing their thing yeah the uh right now the TV's on here has just been absolutely stuck on Bravo so I've, I know way too much about the housewives. I've heard the same stinger a thousand times. <laughs> Brutal. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to compare, uh, if you will, uh, gaslit with beef because it is, they're both naturally, they both look very natural, but gaslit, gaslit does seem to be a little more, um, uh, heightened and that's not like in a artsy way but just like a little a little more uh, massaged in some way did what were your approaches to the lighting in in uh either show um well it's funny gaslit's heightened because we we built a lot that was reminiscent of the film stock back then which was like a hundred speed and much higher contrast um and it you know so naturally you're gonna have like a punchier image just off the bat mm -hmm. uh and we also staged a lot of our scenes around windows and we, you know, outside we had Sykes. So there's a lot more blowout. Um, it was just one for more of a garish look, something a lot punchier, um, mm. and less controlled in a way just to kind of, you know, help transport you back there and make it feel less stagey. Um, with beef, you know, we're, we're actually going much more for realism in terms of like, this is where the actors really live. Um, and we used, um, much cleaner optics. Um, and we ended up building a LUT that was based on overexposure, you know, where you have a, an image that's so bright, you print it down. So you get cleaner blacks and like, you know, nicer highlights, whereas a gaslit was a bit more about kind of lifting the shadows and like an underexposed take on things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, beef, yeah, beef, it's funny. I, I didn't go into beef thinking it was going to be slick. And I think even Sonny was surprised towards the imagery of it. Um, but something about that show just felt, I don't know, I felt like this funny heightened drama to a show that's actually really mundane, you know, I mean, nothing, you know, nothing's too crazy in beef besides maybe episode nine and 10, but everything else is real places and real people. 
And so giving it something of like a, a visual punch, I think kind of helped heighten the, you know, the importance or the weight on these small decisions. Yeah. Uh, when you say that the, the LUT was built on overexposure, you mean like you built in uh, a negative, let's say stop so that you would shoot brighter? Um, the viewing I, LUT or you? That's natural. That what I do now in general with all of my LUTs is I kind of, we have like a, a, the LUTs force me to expose brighter. So it's like a hungry LUT, if you will. It needs more light. So that way right. it's more of just because I like to make things moody and that way I'm kind of protecting myself by having more in the shadows. Um, but then in the, in the grade, we were, we were playing with kind of, um, there's like a scene of Danny and his brother Paul working out, working out. And we were just looking at a funny reference and I was like, well, let's, let's take a look at, um, Top Gun, there's, you know, that volleyball sequence. And I just kind of loved how kind of Southern California it felt this really bright, hot sun is really crisp blacks. And we just um, looked at an overexposure LUT, which does that. You can apply it. You can, there's also an under underexposure LUT, which will kind of lift the shadows and give you that feeling. Um, right. And that's like uh, something you can apply to any LUT um, that was built based on like the film science of like what you did photochemically to it. Um, and so that we ended up really liking it, which is funny because, you know, we didn't expect it to be that type of look right off the bat. Yeah. I've seen you mention a few times, uh, emulating certain, um, emulations or, uh, fucking, what do you call them? Film stock? Film, film stock. Well, I was trying to emulsions. There we go. Jesus Christ. Um, but, uh, are you kind of like a, a film stock nerd in that way? In the, in the way that, um, you know, uh. Steve Yedlin seems to be kind of, it's more about, you know, you know, as getting wildly specific about it. No, but it's going back to like, some part of gaslit was trying to remove cyan. That was a big part of it. There was like a cobalt dark blue in the shadows back then. And so we built that into the look and then we saw that the skin tones, you know, were a bit orangier and they had like a certain patina, um, that we were trying to recreate. And with beef, we wanted something that was, I think we just wanted something that felt American because it's very much a show about an American dilemma for some reason. Yeah. Um, this capitalism is a big part of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we we started trying to find a lot that really pushed skin tones. That so you had like you could uh, for me I love getting ruddy skin tone because I think you start at red and then you kind of taper off into oranges and yellows and things like that. Um, and that's what we started with, but we also wanted to make sure that the other colors would still pop. Um, I was trying to avoid a, a lot that actually felt pushed. That was the other thing with um, beef. It's not, there's not a lot of, um, it's kind of clean in a way. We're not trying to force yeah. colors into the shadows and into the highlights. So we wanted it to feel kind of rich, but also kind of real. Like I didn't want it to feel too affected. I mean, yeah. it, it's more of the contrast in, in beef is what I think stands out. It's punchy. Yeah. I, I, uh, I guess that brings me to a different question, but we'll get back to that. Um, it definitely feels, I think, you know, the, the compliment every DP wants to hear, it doesn't look lit at all, <laughs> but it still um, looks incredibly natural. And I was wondering kind of what, especially in the exteriors, but uh, what were your um, sort of, how are you approaching the lighting to the, the show as a whole? But those exteriors look really nice. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't, think we lit any exteriors on beef really if we did that's, any that's what i'm saying that's it's like i want to know how you got there because it because you could just point to camera at something and it wouldn't look that nice yeah I, I have a hard time lighting exteriors just because it feels like well you know once you you know it's like if you give a mouse a cookie it's like well let's you know we'll you know diffuse this oh i need to punch it up now and then like oh the background is too bright so now we gotta make it brighter then you need to bring in fill because the key's too strong now and it's just i feel like i don't know i just never liked how that looked i think the most we would do is bring in like a circular bounce to get try to give someone an eye light mm. um, and steven you know also the there's like a nice sense of realism that comes with letting hard sun actually hit the actors and then you spend most of your time with the ad just trying to figure out how to schedule around the sun so that they're backlit when you want them to be which is most of the time so you don't have to deal with shadow issues right uh, but yeah, no, we didn't really do much. Also, Allie has crazy glasses on, so lighting her was a huge ordeal. And a lot of times we just kind of tried to light the space in a manner that she would have a decent key. Um, because, yeah, anytime I got close to something, you'd see it right in there. And you think we even 
time and post trying to remove reflections from our glasses. <laughs> I mean, they were great glasses, but we chose ones that were just like, you saw everything. It was, it was, a uh, it was a bad choice, uh, technically, <laughs> but a great choice creatively. Yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing a lot more, uh, corporate videos these days and every, every interview, there's a guy with glasses <laughs> just like, Hey, bud, just, I can see my Kino panel right in your fucking face. Uh, um, but going back to the look, you said you didn't build any color contrast into the LUT. And I was wondering uh, how, like, I, I'm specifically thinking, I can't remember which episode it is, but uh, interior kind of night, there's a great color contrast in the lighting. You did some really good, you know, like cool light and warm light. And I was wondering um, how you were getting those. Like, were those, you know, LEDs that were just set to white balance difference, differences that were kind of brought out in the grade or were those like colored in a way, gels? Um, is that in terms of like interiors or exteriors? In, or interiors, yeah. Usually, well, usually, I mean, Steven's apartment, we kind of tried to have every type of practical from fluorescence to like crappy CFL bulbs to tungsten bulbs. And so there's always like a mix of, of temperature in there. And then usually we'd bounce something in the ceiling if we wanted to, if we did want to affect the shadows in camera, we would, we would bounce a color into the ceiling with something cooler to shift it. Um, and then, uh, for Allie's place, you know, it's very warm in general. And I kind of, we kind of, her place is much more monochromatic. Mm -hmm. So one color tends to dominate in most of the scenes because her world is kind of beige and flat and kind of soulless and, you know, uh, Danny's world is, is kind of cluttered and filled with too much stuff. And so there was never like a perfect balance in between one's kind of boring and one's kind of too much. Mm. But so those were all practicals and those weren't like LED. It's, gen it's for generally practicals. Um, and then, you know, for Steven, we would try to sneak in like a Titan rig to the ceiling just to give him an edge or pop him. Or a lot of times um, we would have these little... Um, forget there's these little leds that you can get like a half dome on top of for an eye light and we would kind of hide those behind counters or on chairs aperture or roscoe i forget we call it the baked alaska it's the soft dome that's kind of wobbly um i think that's the aperture mc but i think it's the aperture um we used we, we used to use the next lights um to do that a lot but they were sure. the, well, the color fidelity wasn't as good um i'm blanking on them i, I there's like a different name for them on every set but those, those are our workhorse. And then, when, you know, for if we'd seen, if they were in like an open area, we would generally line up like um, some skinny light mats in like a long row. So you kind of had a very long, even key that you wouldn't feel. They would just kind of walk in and out of it as opposed to like walking into a spot of light. Right. Those little light, you know, Kino makes one now. Kino's LEDs are stupid accurate. Those things are great. But uh, everyone's making like a nice thin panel that you can basically tape to a ceiling if you need it. So I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying that, uh, change in direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thinner, thinner is better. We, we made homemade ones for a long time with my gaffer, Matt, and we called them Matty pads and they could go anywhere, but they, the color fidelity wasn't great. And it was just homemade, you know, light ribbon and like a shift box. Um, and now everyone's using, you know, like the light mats, um, or whatever the spectrums, a full range of color now. Yeah. Uh, I saw I saw in an interview that you guys shot what the LF with signature primes, mm -hmm. um, and the reasoning that you had mentioned in that interview was that you know starting with a sharper image and then you're able to degrade it and post as opposed to vintage lenses which give you an inherent character that you can not really time out right. Yeah, it was it was also our our we wanted to be close to the actors on wider lenses and we didn't like the characteristics that came with vintage lenses at that focal length. Like they were too warpy and they were a little too funky and they felt too affected. And a part of this show was trying to, you know, be subtle and kind of remove a lot of the style, if that makes sense in terms of like the camera and the lenses. And it was, just, it just felt nice. And also we were in a lot of tight spaces and I hate, you know, like tend that I'm starting to hate warp walls and, and lines that bend. And it just felt nice to have a good workhorse of a lens to get in there and do it. And also like, you know, you, you don't have that many vintage lenses when you're shooting large format either. Yeah. Right. You know, there's a world if we had shot super 35, I may have done it on super speeds, which I think are a nice balance of a little bit of, of edge or, or a funk with a still a good sharp image. Yeah, I heard uh, 
because I'm a good researcher. I heard in a different interview uh, that you had mentioned shooting the LF, but then you were using the crop sensor. Were you not doing that then? No, we were. So we, I mean, I, I don't, I, lo- I love large format photography, but I feel like that's very specific to projects. It's, it's like a very powerful tool that is, that should be used intentionally. And sure. I feel like just using it willy nilly um, is too much. I think it, you know, we have all these great sets and great locations and you know i'm trying to work with minimal light levels as well so i'm not trying to bring in a bunch of lights and so i like to shoot around like a 2.8 and then 2.8 at large format is just very shallow for me i don't like it i want to see a little bit more i'm not trying to see the world um so we crop the sensor into the 4k minimum requirements for streamers so just to get back a little more depth of field and to make the lenses feel a little less dramatic gotcha Um, the only time we use the actual full sensor is the opening scene of Steven and uh, at the like old boat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because him really isolated. And, and so the sound design could do its thing and you could really focus on him kind of having a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, so, but you won't need the full frame lenses so that you could use them in something like yeah. that. Well, the, well, the four, the cropped in 4K wouldn't have worked with super speed. So we still had to stick with those full frame lenses. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, they're fucking great lenses. I was I was at uh, Cinegear and I was getting a tour of all their lineup, and I, like some of them I didn't even know about. But those things will always be top yeah. top notch. <laughs> no, they're great, and you can do a lot in post to take the edge off of them now and to make the audience. I'm not trying to make it funky. I'm just trying. I just don't want them to think about you know the pores on the actor's face or what have you. You know, you I want them to just kind of forget about the photography so that they can just see what's you know what they're, you know, see the performance. And so that we were able to kind of knock it down a little bit. So it didn't feel pristine. Yeah. I, uh, I did want to talk about, uh, your remote grading situation. Cause I just started working with a company called, uh, Evercast, which you, you may have used their stuff before. Uh, and they have like a color pipeline that's accurate, you know, 10 bit four, 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 whatever. So now I'm trying to learn more about remote grading. And I heard you did that on this show. Yeah, I did remote grading for, um, Everything everywhere for gasoline and for beef. Um, I do. I mean, I do it all just from my garage. It's, um, Alex Bickle, who owns Color Collective in New York, and then Alex Jimenez is their t- one of their TV colorists. So I do the bulk of the show with. And so, yeah, it's uh, they. You know, for the everything everywhere. We had whatever a magic box that came in that had to be cabled, and that was for. Um, I think we did it in HDR. But now they finally, I believe, have HDR streaming capabilities, which is just like an app you can use on Apple TV. Um, right. I get a very specific TV from LG, and then the they have C1. one. Yeah, there's like hidden menus that you that you that you can access that can set, you can push the television to do things that you can't normally do. And I just took it to Technicolor and had them calibrate it. Um, but it was, <laughs> I loved it. You know, especially because they're on the in New York time. You know, they're ready to go at 9 a.m. so I can wake up at 6 and like, you know, chuck in three hours before I have to go to work. Yeah. Was there any uh, specific tools besides the hardware that helped you do that? Or were you just kind of like uh, zooming in and they had a pipeline to your TV? No, I mean, for so for Beef, it was just an app. You know, you would get the app going, you turn on Apple TV and boop, you're there. They just say, yeah, Um, I'm very happy about that. (laughs) Um. Yeah, they would do that. And then sometimes I would check it on the iPad to make sure. Like the iPad is is actually the most accurate way of doing it because it's the device and the, it won't look any different based on whatever weird settings could potentially still be on your TV or something that's shifted. Sure. So right on there. And then I would double check the iPad. You know, most most remote coloring still has an issue with shadows. Like the certain at a certain point, the shadow you know, the shadow detail is hard to make uh match what what the colorist is seeing especially if you're playing in the mud right right because yeah the um I've, I've been interested in the idea of grading on an oled or like a micro i think my my grading monitor is like a micro led or something but i was doing a music video and the person i just mentioned this in a different interview but the person was like oh it looks different than on my laptop and i was like well my sh- my screen's calibrated and your laptop is old laptops are terrible like yeah that- so bad that's because the red channel is messed up real bad thank you for saying that i'm gonna clip that and send it to them because they're like we need to it's the skin tones are still too red and i'm like i, I guarantee you they're not and then they oh, said 
the worst thing in the world, which was, uh, well, what if we just cali- what if we just because everyone has a MacBook, what if we grade it so it looks correct on my MacBook? And I was like, that sounds like a good idea, but trust me, it's not. Yeah, that, that's why we it's why we usually kick out stills and look at them on our iPhones or on our iPads. That's the most neutral way to look at it, you yeah. know, because everyone something's always a little different. And then you can just be like, well, take a look at this. So that's what I've done before. I've literally had to like put my iPad or phone next to my laptop and be like, oh, the skin is totally normal. And it just looks insane on my on my Mac. That's great. I didn't know it was specifically the red channel. It's the role, well, not the red channels or something in the reds because what you were saying the ruddy skin tones are just weird red and the skin is, is something i've run into several times when viewing on on the mac gotcha that is uh i think they have it. figured out a way to calibrate it though but i i couldn't go into that my colorist alex knows more about that than i do but he did say there is like a, i think maybe a way now to make it accurate yeah do you find i mean it sounds like you thoroughly enjoy the color grading process do you shoot kind of knowing oh i guess you 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 pre-make the LUTs don't you yeah so we you know we we basically go also because the LUTs are so sensitive to exposure you can't necessarily just shoot a blind test and then apply LUTs to it later because they all do different things so you basically get a batch of LUTs and then try them out in different scenes um and then com- kind of compare and contrast them later but i like to do it all in advance because seeing them on set is this is huge like they go i mean I, I do a lot in the color grade um but i you know in the perfect world you know you walk away from set happy and you're like I'm not going to change a thing but usually you're tweaking the things that were impossible on the day to tweak or you didn't have time to do or just trying to like you know soften an image or deal with a shadow that was you know pain in the ass yeah. So you're not using like an onset colorist. You kind of figure that out and then you just rotate through the less to see what works with the given scene. Um, well, no, so, well, our onset colorist is usually, um, well, my DIT Matt Conrad is the onset colorist basically. And so we'll, you know, you were building in like, um, whatever the levels for each scene and you're adjusting for lenses. Some lenses are greener or cooler. And so you're kind of building that in to, uh, completely blanking on the term but every every scene or shot gets basically like a you know a small lot that goes with it to the edit that's been adjusted and then that gets carried over to the colorist so he's like oh it's you know that looks like the cdl cdl there we go so they're working on a you know there's a cdl for every shot usually just to adjust or like we're chasing the sun or there's coolness going down that's the minutia of it you know and then sometimes you can take bigger swings by like putting green in the shadows because you want a scene to be a little creepier or grungier and it's just not doing it and you don't want to do it with the lighting so just by adding some green in there you can start to make things feel interesting yeah it's uh it, it's certainly the thing that i kind of have the i just put like a whatever let on it and i'm like as long as it looks good like it's it's one that i built but it, i know it's just for exposure basically and then i know i'm going to get in the grade and just play with it for <laughs> hours on end there's always new tools coming. You know, someone comes out with like a film emulation software and you're like, oh, I'll give that a try. And then you're like, that's oh, kind of weird looking and it slows my shit down. But no, I mean, that's like, I think grading your own stuff is this huge part of becoming, you know, of, of evolving as a cinematographer. I, I spent forever grading the bulk of my stuff for five years until I got to a point when someone, then when they were like, you can't grade your own stuff. It's going, it's going to a professional. Yeah. Do have you, uh, has the past like few projects because you did a short in between all these three things right between everything everywhere and the two shows yes um did a short with um there's a couple shorts and i'm thinking about it um which uh, is there a specific one you- oh I, no i was just going off imdb i haven't seen oh. it but uh, the the question was just going to be um you know how how do you feel like you've uh enhanced your skill set so to speak from the last time we spoke and now is there anything that you kind of think about that's made your life easier or maybe lessons you've taken away from all that experience um i mean you uh, i mean i have a better idea about how to work in television now um it's such a different animal from film in that you know it's it's a much bigger collaboration between um multiple directors and writers and showrunners and things like that that trying to get to the bottom of of what you're trying to execute um can be strange if you're used to film where it's generally with the films i've worked on which tend to always be writer directors 
you know, they're, they're the source. You go to them with your ideas and your questions and, and your concepts and they're like, great, let's do it. Tele- with television, you know, it's a, a group effort. And more importantly, the showrunner does have a very important say on it. And so getting on the same page of them is as important as being on the same page as the director. And a lot of times now I'll pick shows. Um, I mean, you pick your show generally based on it's a great script. Um, but also if you and the showrunner connect um, and you can sense that you're the same type of storytellers um, as opposed to say you and the director connect, which is great. But if you and the showrunner like don't see eye to eye or like you're, you're, you're not making the same movie, then it tends to be painful. And so that was a big part of beef as I, you know, the minute I started talking to Sunny, I was like, oh, great. We're on the same page. This is going to be wonderful. Like I'm excited to work with you and have you just kind of be there guiding us to what you, what you imagine the show to be. Um, that was a big thing was just kind of navigating those waters in terms of execution and things like that. Um, uh, I keep thinking I'm going to do away with my music video background, but it's still very present in terms of speed and being clever of schedule and making one scene work for two and reusing locations and things like that. Um, the speed hasn't gone away. <laughs> well, I'm sure, uh, ADs and producers are stoked on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, you have to be, I mean, you know, TV, you're on the same pace as an independent film and that you're doing five to six to seven pages a day. You just have more resources yeah. to execute. Um, but it's also that kind of funny game of like, you have enough money to get in trouble and you may not have enough money to get out of it. So you have to really, you know, when you have like the big, the big day, the big scene of 200 extras, you have to make that day. You're not coming back. Right. That's awesome. Uh, well, I know we're on a shorter interview schedule, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. But, um, a, a question I ask everyone now it cha- it's changed. Uh, but if you were to, it's harder with television, but if you were to put beef in a double feature with another film or series, uh, what would it be? Um, yeah, uh, Good question. I mean, it can compare, it can contrast, you know, or complement or contrast. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't watch enough television. The only show that, I mean, what I liked about beef was it about heroes that are kind of bad people in a way. Uh, well, they're, they're bad people who happen to be the hero of the story. Um, I don't, it's, uh, I guess. White Lotus is probably the closest thing I could think of um, in terms of like a, a show about, you know, like the inner workings of people and the idea of like how to self and selfishness protect and hurt you. Sure. Uh, but they're, you know, on, you know, just like White Lotus on like, yeah, on gasoline, just like <laughs> much bigger, bigger, bigger results. Crazy, right? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Hell yeah. Well, um, it's a great show, man. Uh, I loved it, but also, you know, I'm seeing tons of people uh, enjoying it. So awesome. once again, I am proud of you again. Well, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Uh, you're making something else right now, right? You're shooting something? I just finished a movie called Wolves with John Watts. Uh, oh, hell yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, it's like a dark comedy thriller. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, it's a buddy comedy, I guess, with, um, with Brad Pitt and George Clooney. And we just kind of spent... Oh. Um, all of winter shooting nights in New York, it felt like, um, it was a very interesting process. <laughs> well, when, uh, it's time to talk about that, we'd love to have you back on and, uh, do a chat about that. Cause I'm sure it'll be great. Yeah. There's a lot of stories from that one. That'd be fun. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. As this is an independently funded podcast, we rely on support from listeners like you. So if you'd like to help, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash frame and ref pod. We really appreciate your support. And as always, thanks for listening.